tonight's process. First of all, Nashville Next is a planning process. Two years of planning intended to ensure Nashville's well-being and prosperity for the next 25 years. It combines, the planning process combines the ideas and input of people who care about Nashville, people like us, as well as industry experts on topics important to Nashville's growth. At the end of the Nashville Next planning process, we'll have a plan that looks at arts and culture, economic development, education, environment, transportation, equity, inclusion and diversity, livable and healthy communities, public safety, children and youth, and even more than that. So this is an important plan for Nashville's future. On February 16th, we launched the community visioning portion of Nashville Next, visioning that will continue in various venues and online for several months. Quite a bit of opportunity to participate in the process. The speaker series brings nationally recognized thought leaders to Nashville to discuss topics that are relevant to the, to the country's and Nashville's future. These speakers will challenge us with new ideas and new strategies to address some of the greatest challenges and opportunities facing Nashville. We encourage you to go online to nashvillenext.net, nashvillenext.net, to read the local background reports on economic development, arts and culture, and education for the, next, the Nashville Next planning process. Tomorrow night, the Prosperity con Conversation will continue on News Channel 5 Plus's open line when business leaders Yuri Kunza and Debbie Frank and I will jo join to discuss Mr. Cisnero's speech and share our thoughts on Nashville's prosperity. That's from 7 to 8 p.m. on News Channel 5's open line. The entire speaker series is sponsored by the Greater Nashville Association of Realtors, Regent Homes, and the Village uh, Fund. So thanks to our sponsors for their assistance in bringing these speakers and ideas to Nashville. Okay, so a few notes about this evening's format. After Ms. Mr. Cisnero speaks, he will take questions from the audience. As you entered the auditorium, you received a card. Make notes on that card about your questions, but he will actually be uh, fielding the questions from the, uh, from the audience. So be sure to raise your hand when you have a question as we enter the Q&A phase. Um, if you've not received a question card to make notes on and you want one, just raise your hand and someone will, uh, will get them to you. We also ask you to si silence your cellular devices. However, we do encourage outreach through social media. So if you hear something interesting, and uh, when you hear something interesting, <laughs> text it to MindMixer at 615-970-6600. Did you get that? Did you write that on your question card? or share it on Facebook, Facebook Twitter, or uh, at uh, Pound Nashville Next. Okay, so tonight's topic, just sort of set the stage and then we'll hear from our, from our guest speaker. First of all, economic prosperity is part of our purpose statement at the Chamber. We participate in that effort in a variety of ways, but above all, we do that by helping create an environment for community leaders to be involved in strategic processes that result in job creation. Now that job creation results in strong economies that boast individual and shared prosperity. It's community prosperity and individual prosperity as well. And that's why we're involved in organizations and this entire community participates in discussion on issues like public education improvement, higher education innovation, transportation and mobility, and business and economic development. We were pleased to be asked to author the background paper on economic development with the special assistance and guidance of Dr. Garrett Harper and his participation in the Nashville Next process. 
Economic development is a key activity that ensures a city or region's sustained prosperity, vitality, and resource base for achieving broader aspirations continues to exist. The paper is now posted on the National Next website and shows that the next quarter century offers great opportunity and challenge for cities and regions in their planning and policy and economic development decisions. As we approach 2040, we see a world that is filled with competitive opportunities for the rising well-being of Nashville premised on having the resources available to do sound economic development. This area begins from a position of strength as we look toward the future and 2040. One way to, de to define prosperity is a mathematical formula that takes the cost of living per capita income and creates discretionary income as a part of that, that prosperity result. In this area, our residents, this region, we enjoy a cost of living that is 88% of the national, uh, national average. 88%, that's a positive. And our per capita income is above the national average at 114%. That spread between those two numbers creates discretionary income that people invest in their businesses, in homes, in education, and throughout this community. Part of our vitality is tied to that very important economic advantage that we uh, enjoy in this region. We also know that change is accelerating and the pace of change between now and 2040 is more rapid than it was 25 years ago when we last general plan. That rate of change is reflected in technology, resources, climate, competition, and human, human behavior beyond, around this region. So as we consider change in the Nashville area, we can see the expa expansion of our geography, the expansion of our demographics, our diversity and growth patterns reflected throughout this entire region, but concentrated uh, in Davidson County. The role and function of Davidson County will continue to be influenced by the region and reshaped in the context of the region as the success and vitality of Davidson County continues to help shape our region's uh, vitality and prosperity. So prosperity and economic growth is a foundation for any city and region to support communities through the expansion of tax base as well. If you think back to the 50 years of consolidated government in Nashville, you will note that that consolidated government created a great platform and basis for expansion of our economy that has grown now after those 50 years to cover pretty much a 10 county area. So the key things we'll need to continue to plan for, as you will see in the paper, mobility, creativity, and sustainability, those are hallmarks of the vitality and the growth of the future. Good land use and public policy are influenced by innovation and efficiency and support for an environment where these things can occur. If you project the economy of the present day out over the next 25 years, you will see the opportunity that exists for Nashville, which has a great collection of amenities and the need to continually restore that efficient, efficient living environment. So with the pace of change rapidly accelerating, we can only speculate about the environment of 2040. But the actions result, resulting from the start of Nashville Next and conversations like tonight will let us influence that environment to the degree, to the degree we can uh, at this time. So as one of the top 100 metro areas in the nation that drives our national economy, remember, it's an amalgamation of regional economies that drive a national economy and not vice versa. Nashville will be competing every day for jobs and workers with other metro areas around the country and even more so with the world as we near 2040. Important to realize Nashville's place 
in the global economy as we lay out this 25-year plan. So how we're positioned for maintaining and growing the spread that I spoke of earlier, the positive difference, the 12-point advantage we have in cost of living, and the 14-point advantage in per capita income. All of that is very important to us and a direct result of how our city approaches economic development in the future. And that's why the National Area Chamber of Commerce and all business constituencies are pleased that economic development is one of the four essential pillars of this planning process and the topic of tonight's conversation with Mr. Cisneros. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Henry Cisneros, who brings a national perspective to the topic of prosperity. He is here with us to discuss a topic that he has written about, modern cities as engines of economic opportunity and social progress. Henry Cisneros is the founder and chairman of CityView, an institutional investment firm that's focused on urban real estate, in-city housing, and metropolitan infrastructure. This position in, him, in itself makes him qualified to be with us here tonight. But as we all know, there's much more in-depth career path that preceded his current position. 1981, Mr. Cisneros became the first Hispanic American mayor of a major U.S. city, San Antonio, Texas, and subsequently served four terms as mayor. In 1992, President Clinton appointed Mr. Cisneros the Secretary of U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. After leaving HUD in 1997, Dr. C Mr. Cisneros became president and COO of Univision Communications, the Spanish language broadcaster, which has become the fifth most watched television network in the nation. He currently serves on their board of directors. He has also served as the president of National League of Cities and is deputy chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And he's currently a member of the advisory boards of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Broad Foundation. He is a graduate of Texas A&M, which makes him an SEC fan, and has a master's from the Kennedy School at Harvard and a doctorate from George Washington University, which also makes him an SEC fan. Would you welcome Mr. Henry Cisneros to the stage? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Ralph, thank you very, very, very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I want to add my very, very sincere respect to Mayor Carl Dean on having started this Nashville Next initiative, to the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, which Ralph heads, the Land Trust for Tennessee, uh, Nashville for all of us, and I want to particularly thank the planning staff of the Metropolitan Government, led by Richard Bernhardt, who's handled the logistics for today. And uh, Richard went out of his way yesterday, he and his wife, to pick me up at the airport when I came in on a Sunday afternoon. That's far beyond the call of duty, so I appreciate that. Are we getting a little feedback? Do you hear a little bit feedback sound? Do I need to change something on my lavalier? Okay. Uh, Ralph, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. Um, and I know you lead a good chamber, but if they're half as good as the chamber orchestra, then you got a real <laughs> shot here. That was a very good group, the alias chamber music group. Uh, very well done. And thank you for going out of your way, Ralph, to uh, get the pronunciation of my name correct. My name is Cisneros. Actually, in Spanish, it is Cisneros. I am uh, Hispanic and had the privilege this afternoon of meeting with some folks who I think are probably in the audience from this area's Hispanic community. I was very impressed by the diversity. I, when I go to a community, I'm used to being greeted by the Hispanic leadership and it, it, it generally are, are, are Mexicans. But today I met folks from Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Cuba, Venezuela, Argentina, and Mexico, and that was only nine people in the room. So, <laughs> pretty impressive. As I say, my name is Cisneros, 
or Cisneros, the English pronunciation, but I promise you it is not the things that I have been called when I come to places like Nashville. I've been introduced as Henry Cisnerosis. <laughs> On one occasion, I spoke to a medical group, and uh, I guess they must have been studying uh, all kinds of rare diseases or something before the moment came for my presentation because they had something else on mine. The fellow who introduced me went through the entire presentation of the introduction and, and never mentioned the name. Hard to do. But then the moment of truth came, he couldn't avoid it any longer. He said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mayor Sclerosis. <laughs> so after you've been introduced as a disease, you think it's probably not going to get any worse. But actually, when I was HUD secretary, I uh, used to have to do what they call a state of the city address. And uh, it was at C-SPAN and, and uh, carried over the country. And, and so a lady called in later in the afternoon after I was back in the office, spoke to my assistant, and she said, I'd like to take issue with something the secretary said, but I don't think I could pronounce his name. And then she had like a moment of ethnic inspiration because she said it was something like cheese nachos. So, Ralph, thank you for, for, for putting all the work in uh, to get it right. Um, I am honored to be asked to participate in this process of Nashville, Nashville Next for a variety of reasons. One is because I do, I've spent a lot of time on urban economic development over the years. I'm presently chair of San Antonio's what we call Economic Development Foundation. It's co our collaborative group of government and business focusing on uh, attraction of industry and, and retention of our existing base. But also because in the years that I was mayor, I uh, uh, created and, and oversaw a process that we called then, this was 1983, Target 90. And it was a first time effort on the part of our community to look ahead I didn't want to pick a date so far out, it would have been logical to say target 2000, but that was so Buck Rogers that folks wouldn't have uh, had the patience to stay with it, a first time effort. So we picked a shorter time frame, in that case seven years, which is about what it takes to do anything in a city of any scale, and it proved to be a very, very valuable process. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. But uh, the, the significant thing was that we were we were thinking about the future, and frankly, it wasn't original thinking on my part. I was a big fan of an effort that was done in the 1960s in Dallas, which was the first city goals program that I was aware of, called Goals for Dallas, led by the great Mayor Eric Johnson of Dallas, who articulated in that process, this to show you how these things can pay off, the concept of DFW Airport. That came out of that process, and we know what a unbelievable future-changing strategy that has been for Dallas. Uh, in the intervening years, I watched uh, Seattle and Phoenix and any number of other cities uh, go through the process of, of an urban goal-setting a planning process, and they proved to be very, very, very valuable. Uh, the ones that are the most impressive uh, capture a concept and, and popularize with the folks of the community a concept which I would call cities as masters of our own destinies. I believe, and you have to kind of believe this in order to go through this process, that cities can be masters of their own destinies. That we have it within us, the, po the power to collaborate, the power to, uh, to uh, dream together, envision together, um, and that cities are not just, you know, driftwood tossed out on the stormy seas of economic and demographic change, but that they actually can mobilize themselves and focus resources, target resources in a way that change and shape the future. My dear friend uh, Federico Pena, who was the mayor of Denver a couple of years after I became mayor of San Antonio, I campaigned for him a couple of elections in Denver, and then, as life would have it, 
We served in the cabinet together. I was Secretary of Housing, he was Secretary of Transportation. Uh, used to have a slogan in Denver that he called, Imagine a Great City. That was his campaign clarion call to the people of Denver, Imagine a Great City, and led a planning process there that resulted in the stadium that now is home to the Colorado Rockies, a new convention center, and very importantly, uh, Denver International Airport, uh, which replaced the old Stapleton Airport and was part of the infrastructure that has made Denver the capital of what's called the Rocky Mountain Empire, which is everything from literally the Canadian border through New Mexico, in which Denver is the major kind of economic hub. So I'm a big fan of that concept. I'm also a believer in a reality that while there are many places that don't believe in planning and, and, and many people who don't believe in planning and who don't uh, and who like cities to stay essentially the same. They argue for a, a kind of a stasis or steady state quality of life. And I've concluded over the years there is no such thing. You cannot plan to stand still. You will either plan to go forward or you will slip backward because other places are moving forward and change is moving things forward. And if you're not keeping pace, there is no such thing as standing still because everything around you changes. So you either figure out how to keep the quality of life you want today by preparing for a future, or you will slip backward in quality of life, in competitive position, in virtually every other way. So the attributes of some of the major metropolitan plans that I have seen include the following. One, they have specific goals generally, so there are concrete things that can be done as a result, right? Frequently with timetables, metrics, assignments. Secondly, they cross a broad range of strategies, so it's not about one or two things or projects, but the interrelationship and integration of a whole series of strategies, and very importantly, they involve a lot of people. Uh, I, my process in San Antonio, Target 90, involved over 500 San Antonians uh, who came together in 12 committees. And I, I thought that was useful at the time, but little did I know it would be the most important thing about our plan. And I'll tell you why. Because in the final analysis, you know, you cannot anticipate the future well enough to be precisely correct about every one of the hundred goals we came up with, right? So a lot of those are gonna fall by the wayside, overtaken by events. Um, but educating 500 leaders of the community about what the future could be and how to be nimble and adaptive and, and create a sense of collaboration and getting people to know each other proved to be so invaluable over the years. Later in the years when we had to deal with city budgets or bond issues or educational strategies, et cetera, uh, those 500 people proved to be the leaders that made it happen. There were already 500 people who bought into the vision years ahead before in 1990 or 1995 or 2000 or even into the present. Those things were still being worked out. And those, and, and, and those leaders uh, were immensely invaluable to serve on committees to chair bond packages or all the other concrete, practical, resource-driven things that needed to be done in the years to come. So I just commend you for this strategy you've employed of bringing people together, including this series of speakers with an audience like this that allows for a broader input and collaboration. Now it strikes me that uh, as I think about the Nashville next initiative to this point, that there's some distinguishing attributes already. One of them is the 25 year look ahead, which seems to me to be right. Also, it is the recognition in all of the documents that I've seen of the importance of trying to understand change. Herodotus, the uh, Greek historian once wrote that you can never step into the same river twice. He was right. The, the, even in a practical sense, he was right. 
you step into the river today, but tomorrow the place you stepped in is gone. It's 40 miles down the way. There's new water. It's a new river at that point. So uh, his point was nothing stays the same. And it's very, very true in this business of urban development. You have recognized in this Nashville process the reality of demographic change, of a million new people coming to this area, of the growth of the uh, aging population, uh, which is immensely powerful in our country, and I think uh, it's going to be very powerful here. We today in America have 40 million people over 65 years of age. Over the next 35 years, the planning horizon for your work, that will be 80 million people over 65 years of age. We've got 6 million people over 85 years of age today. In that same time frame, that number will triple. So the 65-year-olds will double, the 85-year-olds will triple from 6 to 20 million. Uh, the implications for a society, for a community of such a large portion of the population, uh, either some, a small percentage, living in specialized housing, but a vast other number having to have better accessorization of the houses that they're in and amenities and support systems in communities and services is massive, hugely important. It'll change the way we think about communities, parks, social services, uh, transportation systems, all kinds of things. And then, of course, the growth of the minority population, people of color in Nashville, is massive. The projections that I've seen show a Latino population that will grow to be something like 34% in 2050 of the Nashville area population. So you have correctly recognized that the Nashville of 10 years from now and 20 years from now is not going to be the Nashville of today. It's a different place. And one has to think in advance about what the iterations of that might be in order to begin to think today and plan today for what that's going to look like. The other thing you've uh, accurately done in the documents that I've seen is recognize that the new infrastructure of urban development, the infrastructure that has been important traditionally, roads, electricity, water, etc., is important but must have a complement in the new infrastructure of the future, which is educational institutions and human capital training. Those will be as important competitively across metropolitan areas as traditional infrastructure has been to date. And I think you've done also a good job in the documents that I've seen of recognizing the equity and inclusion issues, how to create a place that is socially cohesive, uh, a challenge in uh, any American city because of the differences in income, differences in background and ethnicity, and how you create a place that is socially cohesive, therefore create the consensus that makes it uh, possible to build a good quality of life. So I've been asked to focus today on the economic dimensions, the how to create prosperity dimensions. And to do that, I've got to just share with you my own kind of personal bias. And by the way, I hope to speak not too long. It's now 6.17, and, and so maybe another 15 minutes or so. And then the most important portion, I hope, for you, and I know for me, will be to take some questions and, and really kind of get to what interests you and, and get to some dialogue. But let me just say that my thesis, if you will, and I wrote my doctoral dissertation on this at George Washington University 30 years ago, is that cities are fundamentally economic entities, economic organisms. Any place that has grown to any substantial size has done so because there's an underlying economic rationale. Cities, of course, are places where people work, they're places where people live. They're places where people gather and have been from time immemorial. Okay? I mean, go back to Mesopotamian cities, Egyptian cities, Chinese cities. There were places where people 
conduct economic commerce, right? live, learn, gather for religious purposes or ceremonial purposes or matters of state, and have found a way to govern themselves, create some social structure that works. That's what urban places do, right? But among those, the first, the kind of the precondition is a place where people can work, trade, provide, perform economic functions. In the early and old days, the cities grew up around rivers or trade routes or raw materials, all of them economic in character. Rivers, uh, seaports, for example, to carry goods. I'm talking now about the United States, but our earliest cities were Boston, for example, and New York, uh, which survived places that, that didn't have the advantageous seaports. Boston for trading with uh, England, New York, New Amsterdam, Dutch trading center, right? Cities with great rivers. Cincinnati in its day was called the Queen City of the West because of the river traffic and trade. Uh, St. Louis was the opening city gateway to the West. The arch is there as a symbol of its role as the gateway place, but it was river traffic along the Mississippi that made it the center that it was. Cities are located at places near raw materials, like Pittsburgh and the coal needed to fire the steel industry, or Detroit and the nearby ability to move raw materials for what eventually became the automotive industry, or Birmingham, Alabama, and the nearby seams of iron ore and coal, for example, uh, or, or, or places that were kind of transportation crossroads and became great trading centers, like Kansas City and its stockyards, Chicago and its stockyards. In the industrial era, cities grew to be great manufacturers of armaments, appliances, steel rods and, and, and uh, uh, bridging, bridging material, uh, every kind of consumer appliance you could imagine, uh, and that's how Rochester grew, and that's how Buffalo grew, and even as late as the 1950s, cities that we don't think of as industrial cities, Los Angeles, Dallas, had up to 30% of their total jobs were in manufacturing. They came to flourish and exist. If you fly over Los Angeles today, everything south of the downtown and to the east is a huge warehousing and manufacturing area, which has always been industrial and still continues to be. In fact, when I was HUD secretary, we did a, following this line of thinking, did an analysis of the, of the cities in America ranked by who had the greatest percentage of the largest industries in the country. And Los Angeles had, was in the top five in 13 different industry sectors. Nobody thinks of Los Angeles as a manufacturing place, but it has been for computers, for, for uh, uh, furniture, for textiles. Uh, so that role of cities has been important. And even into the modern era, uh, again, cities succeed because they've mastered some economic sector. Houston and energy. New York City and global finance, although you could also add international trade or fashion or media in the case of New York. Miami is the de facto economic capital of Latin America, uh, banking and international trade. Washington DC has made a business of government. Uh, all of those suburbs around Washington DC, are they, they house consultant firms and defense contracting firms and uh, security firms and uh, IT firms, all of them in support of government. San Francisco and San Jose, uh, electronics innovation and continue to be. Out of electronics innovation grew venture capital on Sandy, Sandy uh, Hill Road in, in San Francisco, I mean in, uh, in San Jose uh, at Palo Alto. And, and now that venture capital is spawning biotech innovations, Genentech. Uh, Dallas 
has made a specialty of telecommunications. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, not just the old media, but the new media, games, and uh, every kind of electronic innovation assigned to, 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 to quote, soft power, cultural exports out of Los Angeles. Denver, as I mentioned earlier, is a distribution hub for the Rocky Mountain West. Seattle, software and aircraft. Charlotte, we know, banking uh, in just the last uh, 20 years or so. And Atlanta uh, has been a transportation hub for much of its history and with the continued expansion of the airport, not only a southeast transportation hub, but a global transportation hub with flights all over the world. My own city of San Antonio has evolved from a ranching and tourism and military center, military since uh, the 1930s when aviation really was seriously invested in and we ended up with five military bases in San Antonio to today a city that continues to be very strong in, the, in, in military, but has added the biosciences, 140,000 people in, 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 in biomedically related industries, medical school, dental school, nursing school, uh, research capabilities, military medicine, headquarters of all military medicine for all four services now, uh, and uh, manufacturing with the largest Toyota plant uh, manufacturing Tundra and Tacoma pickup trucks, uh, 200,000 a year, uh, with just just uh, on the south side of the city. So, uh, uh, my point is, the the primacy of, of economics of, of of building a an economic base. Nashville and Davidson County, it strikes me, have a textbook diversity of economic uh, sectors. If you were to study the American economy of the last 50 years, you would see in very dramatic ways the transformation from the, the, the American economy that fueled urban America in the 50s and 60s and 70s and the economy that, that has created the new, not just the new American economy, but the new urban economy. And the new urban economy is no longer manufacturing primarily. As I say, cities even like Dallas and Los Angeles had 30% of their jobs in manufacturing as recently as the 1950s, even 1960, right? But today you would say higher education, medical centers, international trade, logistics and distribution, new media, uh, business and professional services, tourism, hospitality, right? So if, if that's the makeup of the new American economy, and I'm persuaded that it is, right, with great institutions supporting each of those, great you know, complexes and dynamic centers supporting each of those, then Nashville is almost the textbook case because Nashville is music, which is part of the new media, Publishing, healthcare, higher education in large numbers, state government, and a distribution center for the kind of upper south. So Nashville starts from a very, very good place, which is a good representative set of the new industries that are the linchpins for the new urban economy. And the question becomes, well, how do you sustain the next generation of those? How do you build the infrastructure that supports them so you keep them, retain them, right? And how do you attract firms and, and spur the creation of new, spontaneous, small businesses as well as attract firms that, 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 that will be part of the, the, the urban future? So let me wind down here by sharing with you some principles. I've written down kind of nine things, and I'll try to go through them quickly, but nine things that, to me, from my background in this field, working since 19, I guess, 72-ish or so, between academic work and, and, and work in San Antonio City Council, mayor, 
traveling to over 200 different American cities as Secretary of HUD for President Clinton in every one of the 50 states. Um, some of the things that strike me as I try to compare the Nashville future and a little bit of what I know uh, 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 about this field. First, uh, these are just general principles. First is the importance of a quest for a diversified base. That's the sacred grail. That is the mantra in, in most cities, to try to create a diversified economic base so we don't create a future like Detroit's or like Pittsburgh, where everything is rooted in one or a handful of industries, but a city has the ability to ride out economic cycles, right? And that's hugely advantageous, not just to avoid a crash, but even to avoid the highs and lows um, and find the, a floor under the area economy out of the diversity. Very important. And, and I think, uh, as I said, you're a, a kind of a textbook case of a series of sectors, but they have to be strengthened. Going back to the point I made earlier, nothing stands still. So many cities thought they were set forever because they were real good at one or two things. And then economic cycles change, industries go out of fashion, some disruptive event you know, changes. A disruptive event is, by the way, a positive concept in the, in, in the way modern folks think about, about economics. They're, they're looking for the, the industry disruptive event because out of the disruption comes a new industry. And so if you're not looking for the disruptive event, then somebody's going to disrupt your events. And, and, and uh, so this whole concept of having enough breadth across a whole range of, of industries and, and, and diversity is very important. Point two, where are you good enough to be great? Lots of cities, and I've seen this a hundred times, mayors, uh, municipal leaders, dream about some completely new economic sector, as if you could, using municipal governmental powers, wish something new into existence. Ain't gonna happen. Uh, uh, there, every, every fad that I can think of in recent years, from uh, teleports to uh, alternative energy, to, and, I'll, and I'm not a, uh, against that, I just don't think that enough is, a, is a sector enough to carry much in terms of jobs. Uh, fashions come and go, but what you've got to build on is what you're good at already. Your best chance of being great at something is based on what you're good at already, because this is complicated stuff. So, to be good requires not only a critical mass, but it requires people who are skilled in doing it, people who are motivated in that direction. You can't turn a ship like this in a short order. So you, you, you kind of have to go with what you're strong at and figure out a way to take it to the next iteration, figure out a way to take it to the next level. So that's a very important question. For us in San Antonio, uh, we have, over the last 30 years, really doubled down on the biosciences because we had a medical school, dental school, nursing school, one of the largest military hospitals in the United States system, Brook Army Medical Center, um, a big research institution, Southwest Foundation for Bio for Research, and basically derived a logic that, that focused on four pillars medical education, medical research, medical clinical capabilities, and medical companies to spin off academic ideas and clinical ideas into products, medical devices. And we have, we have, we have really worked it, not just through the Economic Development Foundation that I had, but, in, but another entity we call Biomed SA, right? So my point is, uh, you, you take what, what exists and then, and then try to create a, 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 a catalyst, if you will, out of that whole dynamic. Point three, um, traditional infrastructure is important. Um, 
there's almost a mathematical precision. It's almost formulaically predictable that you need uh, spinning reserves of electricity, good and well-priced water, uh, roads that don't get overly congested and function, uh, increasingly mass transit systems, uh, add now broadband and communications capabilities. So the traditional heavy infrastructure uh, continues to be important. Roads is the classic case of living with what you have is not enough. Because living with what you have as it gets more congested and you add a million people ends up being a negative. And we're getting business in San Antonio now from places that didn't keep up with their basic infrastructure and are either overpriced on energy or, or congested in roads. And so just keeping up is expensive and requires planning, but it's what keeps you from falling behind. So traditional infrastructure, attention to it as non-PC as that is today, to build more road capacity, to generate more electrical capability is, is important. Fourthly, um, one has to look at one's existing assets and figure out how you mobilize those assets. And as I said earlier, the new infrastructure, the new language of infrastructure is higher education. And education, generally. Uh, but, I, but let me just say, Public education, K-12, K through 16, in the service of building the kind of excellence that produces first-rate, high-quality higher education. Uh, and while there are a lot of similarities with uh, between uh, Nashville and Austin, uh, many uh, country music being the most obvious, state capital being another. But I got to tell you, the University of Texas at Austin is a powerhouse, powerhouse institution, 50,000 strong. And um, the envy of all of us who are not in Austin. Uh, I'm in San Antonio with the University of Texas at San Antonio, which is a 27,000 student institution, just like you have Middle Tennessee, 27,000 student institution, but not of the research quality or attraction that is the University of Texas at Austin. So we all have to, all of us who aspire to building cities of the kind that I've been describing tonight, have to get as close as possible to that research-based science, technology, technology, education, mathematics base that fuels the absolutely important industries of the future. And uh, uh, it's why Stanford fueled Silicon Valley. It's why um, MIT and Harvard fuel the Cambridge complex. It's why the University of Texas does what it does in Austin. It's why aspires to those thrones. Uh, Arizona State in Phoenix uh, drive in that direction so hard. Um, and so that's an essential piece. You, you're, you're kind of in the same position we are uh, in San Antonio in the sense that you have uh, an institution that's not the flagship for the state, Middle Tennessee as opposed to the University of Tennessee. We have the University of Texas at San Antonio branch, now have a Texas A&M branch as well, but they're new. We, we breathed that into life in 1969. And we and we and we you know kind of drove to get an engineering school for it, and thank goodness we did that. But I'll just tell you, we just lost a major aircraft manufacturing facility that would have been uh, as 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 significant as the Toyota plant we have because we lack the technical and engineering manpower uh, to support it. And they made reference specifically to the lack of ability to produce people out of our university for that purpose. So this is, I think, uh, an important uh, thing going forward. Number five, uh, the importance of creating local government collaboration. You start with a great 
platform, as Ralph said in his opening comments with Nashville, Davidson, MetroGov, I have studied that since 1971 when I was here as a young uh, researcher at the National League of Cities and came to Nashville and Jacksonville uh, to study uh, metropolitan government. Uh, and I think it's a, a great plus, but it doesn't always guarantee the kind of responsiveness that you have to create in this world of competitive economic development. So one-stop business centers, creating the proper incentive structures, uh, recognizing you know, how, to, how, to, how to be able to pull everybody in the same room and, and, and get answers to questions that businesses need. That's to say, industries that are coming in that are large, as well as small businesses in the community today. Uh, so that kind of workable, functioning economic collaboration. Sixth, uh, you have put a lot of time into, in this planning process, into focusing on regionalism. I commend you for that. It is the right thing to do. Uh, there is no such thing, really, as, uh, as a city alone from its county or from its metro. There, it, it just, we think of it that way governmentally, but the best analogy I can give you is when I fly into a city at night, I can't tell where the city begins and ends. I only see lights. And the lights are all interconnected. And the interconnection is the urban organism that I was describing earlier. And they, they, they you know, business and economics really kind of doesn't understand or respect city limits lines and, 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 and jurisdictions. So the only way to really plan this mechanism is to think about it as a whole. And uh, uh, so that's, that's an important notion in my mind. Seventh is the investment in human capital that I've mentioned several times, including the, function, the, the, the technical and engineering capability that is going to be needed in the future. Um, you may somehow think that because Nashville is music and tourism and, and, and uh, healthcare and publishing that, that, you know, investing in science, technology, engineering, mathematics is not a forte or needed, but it's where the economy is going and it's places that have those capabilities are going to be rewarded. Eighth is uh, to create a foundation out of small business. Uh, very few cities do this very well. In fact, I can't think of a place that I would, I, could, I know the places that do industrial attraction well, I know the places that focus on next generation technology well, uh, I know the places that do venture capital well, I can't tell you one that has made a, a, a virtue of supporting their small businesses. And yet, uh, that's where the bulk of jobs come from. Uh, we, we, in our town, you would get a headline if a firm announcing 500 jobs announced that it was coming to the city, they'd probably get front page of the business section, front page of the business section, maybe even the front page of the paper, right? But we can do 500 jobs in small business every month if we do this right. We can take businesses that are small entrepreneurs who start with three people and grow them to five and grow them to 10 and create an economic base under the, under the foundation of the city that supports it through good times and bad. Right? So there's a lot to be done. Access to capital for small businesses, networking so that they can contract with larger firms and community college and, and school districts and higher education and big metro medical centers, or contract with small businesses um, in, a, in a systematic way. Uh, strategies to uh, train entrepreneurs themselves. We started a program at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in San Antonio, which was to focus on the real skills, not certificates and degrees, but what are the real skills that the entrepreneurs need? And they're not everyone the same, right? Some need some help in understanding some accounting. Some need some help in understanding some capital formation issues. Some need some help in understanding a real estate decision they have to confront. Others, in a human resource issue they need to confront. So we created this kind of mentoring structure to get them the help they need because 
people were, we were finding out that people were, there was a woman who was very good and had a passion about uh, generating school supplies to help teachers. But she didn't know the first thing about business. She had wonderful ideas, but she needed help in setting up a business. Now she has a very substantial business. School supplies business for helping teachers. Um, people, people come to all the time and they, they, they have a special recipe that they inherited for great pan dulce, sweet bread. So they want to set up a bakery, but they don't know anything about business. They know how to bake, but they don't know how to set up a business. With help, we need good bakeries. So uh, those kinds of things can be done in the small business arena. Finally, number nine in these things that I've listed, sort of principles to think through in the economic development realm is what I would call the social progress agenda. And uh, I commend your leaders for incorporating this in their thinking about Nashville Next. Social progress, inclusion, equity, racial justice as intentional goals. Not as sidelights, not as byproducts, not as hopeful outcomes, but intentional goals. And I think that's the next big breakthrough in this thinking about urban economics and urban economic progress is uh, to use it in conscious ways to create um, you know, some sense of social progress. An example would be in the small business arena. I mean, if, if you have a Latino population that's growing to several hundred thousand, and they are very good entrepreneurs. I mean, you give a Latino construction worker the opportunity to set up his own company, right, with his sons, and you've got a going business. I mean, I, I went to church uh, uh, in uh, Phoenix one Sunday, um, and the priest recognized me, so he asked me to come out and stand with him at the back of the church as the people were coming out, and every man I greeted was in the construction business. You could tell by the calloused hands and the dirty boots, and, and when I asked them, that's what they told me. And I went out to the parking lot and saw all the pickup trucks with Martinez and Sons, and Nunes and Sons, uh, 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 a, a, a wheelbarrow in the back and some tools. Um, uh, and, and that's, to me, not just an economic development strategy, but that's wealth. That's the difference between working for somebody and putting some wealth together, having a net worth. That's uh, the ability to grow a business and employ some people. That's the ability to hand it off within the family and create intergenerational wealth. So we can intentionally create economic strategies that are tilted in the direction of that kind of you know, social progress. I believe in that and I, it, you know, it's an untested idea, but I, I, I believe that, that that's an important direction for us. And uh, it makes life better uh, in our communities. Um, it's, it's a much better strategy than uh, social welfare, uh, income maintenance, uh, if you give people the chance to work and give people a chance to make not just an income, but also some wealth. I used to, people used to ask me about the focus as a, you know, they call me first Latino mayor in the, of a major American city. That's not really true, because there was a wonderful man named Tejas, who was the mayor of El Paso before I ever came along. But um, they, they, they were surprised that I put the focus on, on economic development that I did. It was my, my, my theme when I ran for office. It was what I did for eight years. And um, it was a source of questions because if you're serious about economic development and you follow some of these principles, then you end up doing things that are not so traditional for, for what people expect of you. For example, I backed a nuclear project because we needed the energy and we could produce energy at a cheaper price with nuclear power than we could other ways. And that was kind of outside the box but it proved to be the right thing all these years later. Uh, worked with a lot of developers in a day when developers were not among your more respected groups of people in San Antonio. And uh, worked with a lot of developers, but I used to say to people, our motives 
we, we're, we're working on the same thing, but our motives are different. They, like, they want to make some money. I'm all for it. But I, I want to create some jobs, and I want to employ some people. And they've got to make money in order for us to be able to employ people and put them on the path toward an expanding economy. So we come at this from a different place, but we work together on the same things. So my point is that uh, if we're serious about thinking ahead about how do we create a, a community in which inclusion and some kind of social equity are part of the agenda, then that becomes a, a driving motive for our economic development efforts as well. Well, Ralph, I don't know whether I've covered the range of things you wanted me to talk about tonight. Richard, I don't know where you are in this audience, if or anywhere. Yeah, right over here. But uh, that's what I have to say tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Okay. A few years ago, uh, Univision was planning to come to Nashville to open a local station, mm. but it didn't happen. So, as you said on the board, <laughs> we uh, have a 10% of Latino population in Davidson County, and we don't have a local Latino station. Mm. Okay. Do you think that they might entertain the idea again to bring the station to Nashville? Question was. I was president of Univision, the Spanish language broadcaster, which just passed NBC as the fourth largest uh, broadcaster in the United States. Long ago, passed everybody in certain markets. It's the number one uh, station in Miami. It's the number one station in Los Angeles. It's the number two or three station in New York. It's the number three station in Chicago, and on and on around the map. And so the question was, uh, would Nashville, look, it's got about 20 TV stations, well not 12, maybe 15 TV stations, uh, would Nashville be a logical place? And the answer is that Univision, the parent company, has a, um, a, a kind of a, 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 a policy that it's only gonna locate its stations in the very largest Latino population cities. So Los Angeles probably has, I don't know, three or four million Latinos in the uh, eight million people of Los Angeles County, right? Um, and so Univision has its stations in Los Angeles, Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, uh, Miami, Chicago, New York, just a handful. The rest of the stations in America that have Univision, that are called Univision stations, are run by a company called Entrevision. And Entrevision has about 30 of them. And they are in places like Tucson, San Diego, Corpus Christi, Laredo, um, Denver, Las Vegas. That would be the logical place, I think, to try to persuade to, to put a Univision station in Nashville. And, and it's entirely plausible. With the growth in the Mid-South, I think it's just a matter of time. But that would be the place to focus. Does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Anybody? Yes, sir. We see a lot of um, uh, public relations strategies involving um, consumption of goods and services from local businesses. Mm -hmm. Everything from restaurants on up to uh, awarding government contracts. Um, I uh, played with that, you know, idea uh, as mayor, and it, 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 it's got a kind of a, a populist dimension to it. It's got a kind of popular, kind of a, a nationalist kind of dimension, you know. But it ends up being uh, a kind of thing where you can get hurt in the sense that we've got a lot of businesses that export. And if every city in the country focused on just buying local, then uh, we'd get our, some of our businesses would get hurt in, in, in trying to sell in Houston or in Dallas or in other places. So most economists don't, don't uh, push that idea except as you know, a, a, a nice concept, but in an operative style, it really, it really doesn't function because we're so inter, interrelated as an economy. I mean, I think it's a, a nice local principle and, when, and ought to be observed if possible. 
but uh, it's probably not the way that we end up building you know, a, re a full economy. That's my immediate reaction to it. So I, I, I you know, kind of played with it, but never really um, articulated as a major principle of what we do. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the science of economic development, there is a recognition of the way you build a local economy is by exporting. I mean, and think of it. The only way you're going to get new dollars in that are not already here is bring money from somewhere else. So exporting is really important in, in, in building an area economy. You export from here like crazy. I mean, all of that music that goes out of here brings dollars back here from somewhere else. Somebody's buying right this minute as we speak in a uh, store in Dallas, right, a product that percentages of it were going to come back here to a production house, a publishing house, or somewhere, right? Uh, similarly, the, the Christian publishing, and similarly, the, uh, the, the, the people who come and use medical facilities here or send their children to Vanderbilt. Um, so the, the, we're so interlocked, and exporting is so important that really buy local ends up being just a sliver of a, of, of a strategy. Does that answer your question? Not what you wanted to hear, but that's my thoughts. Mm. Okay. Yes. The question was uh, the, the, the growing population of seniors and the significance of uh, that issue, and particularly in housing. I just finished uh, editing a book with Stanford uh, University. Uh, called Independent for Life. And what we focus on is the fact that only about 4% of the senior population that I described earlier, which is just the gray tsunami, right, um, is going to be living in a nursing home at any particular time. Most people, 90 plus percent, tell you they want to stay in their home as long as they possibly can. So we looked at that in this project, which I think is like one of the first on this subject that's been done, and found out that um, when you talk to seniors in a town hall format and they tell you what, what anxieties they have about living on their own, they will tell you it is getting, becoming isolated because they can't use their car, it is uh, fear of being left alone, uh, it is the fear of getting sick or having an accident and having no way to communicate with people. It is uh, running out of money, uh, not having enough money to keep the house that they're in, keep it up. Um, it is uh, just the, the depression that comes with frailty eventually, etc. Uh, this is a huge issue in our country. Now, what we pursued in this book was the idea that uh, since people are going to be in their own home, we have to make it as safe as possible and as supportive as possible. And I think we're on, just on the edge in America of thinking through what are the, uh, what are the, what are the decisions we're going to have to make to allow people to stay in their own home. And so just like we had for the last 30 years, a strategy of weatherization, where we weatherize people's homes in order to make them more energy efficient, we're going to have to be thinking, how do we create the lifelong home? How do we create zero step entrances? How do we remove dangerous stairs inside the house uh, from level to level, for example? How do you lower bathroom fixtures so people can use them comfortably? How do you lower kitchen cabinets so people can reach them? How do you change what are presently knobs to levers that a frailer hand can pull and function? How do you change the lighting in the house so when a person gets up in the middle of the night, they don't fall down, right? So the point is, there are ways to create a physical environment that are more conducive to allowing people to live on their own for a longer span of time. And with it comes peace of mind, being in their own home, 
uh, et cetera. Um, now, that's going to mean retrofitting existing homes. It's going to mean creating a new supply of more age-appropriate, smaller-scale homes for people who want to move out of the McMansion in the suburbs and, and live in a more rational place for aging. It's going to mean retrofitting entire communities to make them more walkable, livable communities. And by the way, there's a huge movement, I don't know whether it's coming to Nashville, called the Virtual Village Network of people who have created virtual communities where even though you don't change the physical community, you link people up so they can get ride to the grocery store, ride to the doctor, someone look in on them from time to time for their medicines, somebody to come help them uh, with the food if they need it, etc. So a virtual community, the first one was, was created in Beacon Hill in Boston. One of the more active ones is on Capitol Hill in Washington. Uh, it's really something. And 150 of them now exist in America thanks to the technology. Um, they're kind of a, kind of a cooperative uh, of elderly people themselves. Um, so that's a, a, a really big theme that's coming along. My mom is uh, 89, lives by herself in the house that she and my dad bought in 1945 before I was born in 1947 where I grew up, my brothers and sisters grew up, and you could not get her out of there with dynamite. You just, you're not gonna get her out of there. I mean, I, I thought I heard her say once that she was thinking about it, so I brought it up, and I got my head chopped off. Um, it's just not gonna happen. So, so we, my, my dad had had a stroke earlier, so we uh, had had a ramp put in so we could get around the front entrance for him, leading to a deck in the back where he used to sit in the sun, He's passed away now. Um, and so a lot of the, we, the bathroom fixtures have been lowered. There's some minor things we need to continue to do, not minor, there's some things we need to continue to do for her. One of them we did a couple of years ago, which is a new oven, new uh, range that had a kind of less dangerous features to it and, and things she could operate and wouldn't leave the heat on by accident, leave, leave the gas on by accident, for example. Um, so we've got, we've, got a, we've got a phenomenon coming before America that most people don't even know is upon us. And we need to be thinking smartly about it. Uh, there are some cities that are actually way out there now. Uh, University, I mean, uh, uh, Davis, California is revamping their zoning code uh, so that they allow what have been called granny flats in the past but are really just allowing a second house on a big lot so that, on, a, on an ample sized lot, so that grandma can live in a separate unit, right? Uh, their builder is building what they call the prototype house, the house that's built for a person who is gonna live in there until they're older, including, including uh, Lennar Builders, a major national builder just rolled out a product in San Antonio where it's connected by a hallway to a suite where an adult can live on the ground floor um, but have privacy. The suite, I use the word suite because it's not just a bed, it's a little kitchen and its own bathroom and such. So an elderly parent can come home and have their own privacy but still have to be uh, near the family. I mean, all kinds of things like that, you know, all kinds of things. Communication devices where people can let you know that they're sick, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of that's coming, all of that's coming. It's a huge industry. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody's really, you know, nobody's really there. Uh, the mayor of one of your Tennessee cities, Mayor Littleton, or is it Littlefield? Hmm? Littlefield of Chattanooga is way down the road on this. Chattanooga's a very progressive place. They've done some fabulous stuff with uh, amenities, community amenities, and, 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 and this strategy of thinking through houses and neighborhoods for a population that is going to be old. Big, big, big important thing. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Another question or two? We have time? I'll stay for whoever, because uh, we got a number of questions. One more. Okay. Well, you pick it then. I'm not going to pick the last one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's spin around and see. That. Back there. <laughs> White sweater. White sweater, on the corner, yeah. on the edge. 
I heard that um, with public education, if we don't achieve a good reading level by third grade, the student is destined to not graduate, is more likely to not graduate from high school, more likely to wind up in prison that will have to support that person in prison. I've also heard that there are lawyers, people who graduate with law degrees, they're having a tough time finding work. So my question is to see if you have any ideas on A, how we can increase public education success, and B, how to uh, integrate public education better with industries of the future. Well, those are, there's, a, there's a lot in there, and uh, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. First of all, there's a lot of evidence that shows if students don't get an early start, they fall behind, and the uh, likelihood is there, I mean, the, the uh, uh, not probability, but the, the, the greater chance that they will uh, drop out or not complete uh, or uh, not perform. Um, it, it is heightened. That's pretty well established. Um, so one of the themes you probably need to think about in your work is early childhood education. Um, Denver passed a referendum and imposed a sales tax on themselves. Well, actually, I think they funded a bond issue to set up citywide pre-K. San Antonio, in November, our present mayor, Julian Castro, who many of you may have seen on television, uh, he delivered the uh, keynote address at the Democratic Convention. So he's uh, emerging as a, a really substantial uh, player. Uh, this, in the presidential election of this year, passed a one-eighth cent sales tax that was voted by I don't know, 55 to 45 it passed, to create citywide pre-K. Now, it's not really citywide, because we're not gonna reach every single child, but we're gonna create four big pre-K centers of a couple of thousand children each uh, in four major quadrants of the city. Uh, to, to, so so we'll, we'll address something like, I forget the number is, but it's like, 50% of the pre-K on top of what's already been done in Head Start and others. So this is a commitment to the very concept you're describing, which is pre-K gives you the start. The, the, the key phrase is ready to learn by kinder, ready to learn by first grade. Um, and, and, and more and more cities are going in that direction. Uh, there's a lot, I mean, it's almost incontrovertible evidence. Um, you've heard of a company called USAA. It's a big uh, uh, military insurance company. They're headquartered in San Antonio, 13,000 jobs. Um, the mayor asked the head of USAA to chair a task force before this referendum and answer the question. If we had $20 million a year to allocate to education in our city, what would be the most valuable thing to allocate it to? Would we put it in scholarships to college? Would we put it in after school programs? Would we put it in better physical facilities? Would we put it in labs and equipment in schools? Where would we put it? And after a year of research, they concluded pre-K. So that's what we put on the ballot, and that's what passed. So um, the, the, uh, the long and short is that the very concept you described uh, is, is, is correct. Now, how to link up businesses and education. Lots and lots of business people care about education. In cities, in almost every city in America, the leading businesses are in some part of a consortium, are some part of a task force to focus on improving the quality of education. Public education, charter schools, uh, uh, academies that specialize in special areas. In San Antonio, we have one on manufacturing, one on aerospace, um, uh, uh, public health magnet schools, uh, et cetera. But um, almost everywhere, the business gets it. I mean, 
So business people are not the ones that need to be educated generally. They get it. It's the it's the it's the broader general public that doesn't want to want to spend the money. Um, so um, I don't know that I've answered your question uh, completely, but the, the the point is, you would be greatly remiss if you came out of a planning process like this, and major commitment to education was not part of the recommendations. And and my guess is. You're, you're going to find that pre-K uh, is a big part of it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, so, before we before we depart, uh, let me just let me just say that uh, you're exactly what we hope for: genuine and knowledgeable. And uh, if you look at a definition that goes with the article written by. Dr. Henry Cisneros. <laughs> Among these themes is the quest for individual and family advancement in the economic and social hierarchy of society, the confluence of dreams and ambitions to improve the, one's lot in life. It's really all about the people, and I think you communicated that extremely well. Nashville Next continues. You've invested this time. Nashville Next has invested in this expertise. Please go to nashvillenext.net and participate in the discussion. You can find the economic development paper, but you also have the opportunity to comment. Also remind you that in two weeks at, uh, at, at uh, Skerritt Bennett, we will have Doug Farr joining us for a speech titled, Sustainable Urbanism and Community Livability. Did you get that? Sustainable Urbanism and Community Livability at Skerritt Bennett on Monday, March 25th at 5.30 p.m. And again, thank you, Dr. Cisneros.